The Hurstbridge Line is a 38km electrified suburban railway line running from Melbourne CBD out to the Diamond Valley on the northeastern edge of the suburbs. This line has a character quite unlike any other part of the network, with several tunnels, large bridges and extensive sections of single track. The outer part of the line is very scenic, running through patches of native bushland and through open paddocks. In this video I'm going to talk through the many interesting and unique features that can be seen along the way, and run through some of the line's history, as well as covering how it operates today. This video is illustrated by pictures and footage I've taken over the last 20 years, many of them taken during regular commuting. It's ended up being a lot longer than I expected, as it turns out I can talk about this line almost indefinitely. However, the video is still short enough to watch on the train between the city and Eltham. We're going to start at Flinders Street Station in the heart of Melbourne. Hurstbridge Line trains usually depart from Platform 1, although can also run off 2 or 3. Most of the time trains depart to the west, running clockwise around the city loop before starting their journey out to the suburbs. But I've spent plenty of time talking about the loop in other videos, so today we're going straight out towards Jollymont. Before the loop was built in the early 80s, the Hurstbridge line actually used to depart from a separate station known as Prince's Bridge, which was later absorbed into Flinders Street and then closed. You can still see where the end of the platforms were, sticking out from under Federation Square, and that building on the end is the former Flinders Street D signal box. The line breaks away from all the other eastern lines and is quickly surrounded by parkland, with the Fitzroy Gardens to the north and a series of small linear parks to the south. The ramp coming up from the city loop appears on the northern side of the line and joins up on a flat junction, which is why trains on this line only operate clockwise around the loop these days, avoiding a conflict here. Passengers will see trams running parallel along Wellington Parade on routes 48 and 75. The first station, Jollymont, is normally pretty quiet, but springs to life when sporting events are on at the nearby Melbourne Cricket Ground, which is a short walk across Yarra Park. The MCG holds 100,000 spectators, and thankfully fewer than 10% of them arrive by car. Nearly everyone arrives by train, tram, or on foot. In fact, because of these big sport crowds, more passengers pass through this station annually than any other non-CBD station on the line. Jollymont has a number of adaptations to deal with this sudden influx of livestock. Both platforms have these cages which funnel crowds past multiple Mikey readers, and wide footbridges are positioned at either end of the station. Jollymont unusually has its major nearby attraction listed prominently on the station sign, although it's not actually part of the station name, and there's only one other station on the network with signs done in this style. Despite being the first part of the line coming from the city, it might surprise you to learn that this actually isn't the oldest part of the line. Once upon a time, Melbourne was blessed with this thing called the Inner Circle, and the first part of what we now call the Hurstbridge Line opened in 1888 between Collingwood and Heidelberg, connecting to the rest of the network via the Inner Circle, although some passengers may have changed at Clifton Hill for the more direct, but slow, cable tram service to the city. The direct line via Jollymont wasn't opened until 1901. Leaving Jollymont, the line enters a pair of curved brick tunnels, carrying the line under a couple of small hills as well as the busy Wellington Parade and Hoddle Street. Railway tunnels are surprisingly uncommon in Victoria. To be clear, I'm talking about tunnels in the traditional sense, that is, where the line passes underground to avoid steep terrain, as opposed to an underground line with stations like the City Loop or long road underpasses that don't actually go underground. Using this definition, there are only four proper tunnels on the suburban network, and all of them are on the Hurstbridge line, with two of them right here at Jollymont. The first one is about 145 metres long, followed by a quick 75 metre gap, which is very scenic and looks like a little slice of Sydney. Then the second tunnel is slightly shorter, at 113 metres. Exiting the second tunnel, the line passes immediately under a road bridge before arriving at West Richmond Station, which features curved platforms and attractive brick buildings on both sides. The view back into the tunnel at the up end of the station is quite interesting, and unlike anywhere else in Melbourne. If you're not familiar with railway terminology, the terms up and down refer to direction relative to the city, with up being towards Flinders Street, and down being towards the country. Heading north from here, the 1901 alignment was built through existing suburbs, and to minimise impact, the line was elevated on a 2.3km embankment. This was kind of Skyrail before Skyrail was cool, crossing over no less than 17 streets on low bridges. Passengers are treated to a great view out across the rooftops, and it's a much subtler approach than the modern elevated sections being built today. However, the construction still would have had a significant impact on residents, and in some places you can clearly see where the embankment cut through existing lines of terrace houses. From West Richmond, it's just 335 metres along the embankment to North Richmond, the second shortest distance between any two stations on the network. I was going to say it was the shortest, but then I was pointed at Riversdale to Willison, which is 25 metres shorter. Thanks, John. North Richmond has by far the least interesting building on this section, 
but is the interchange point for tram routes 12 and 109, which run east-west along Victoria Street. The bridge over Victoria Street is decorated with bamboo and tigers as part of the Victoria Street Gateway, welcoming road users to Melbourne's Vietnamese district. However, this project completely ignored the thousands of passengers passing overhead each day, blocking out the previously good view of the street from the train. Continuing along the embankment, the line makes a slight wiggle to the east, presumably following the path of least resistance through the 1901 suburbs. Collingwood Station has a pleasant weatherboard building unlike any other on the line and sits in between a nice park and the Collingwood Town Hall. At the end of the down platform is this unusual sign. This reminds drivers to pull up right to that point, as at both here and the next station, pulling up short can result in the last door of the rear car opening into thin air over the street off the end of the platform, something I've seen happen several times. Leaving Collingwood, the line S bends back west again, arriving at Victoria Park. This is where we joined the original 1888 alignment to Heidelberg. If you've been paying attention, you'll remember I said that that began at Collingwood. However, just to be confusing, Victoria Park was called Collingwood at the time, getting its current name when the direct route opened. The new station to the south opened as Collingwood Town Hall, dropping back to just Collingwood a few years later. Victoria Park is the name of the adjacent football oval, home of the Collingwood Football Club for 107 years up to 2004. Bizarrely, none of these locations are actually located in the suburb of Collingwood, not even the Town Hall. They're all in the neighbouring suburb of Abbotsford, while actual Collingwood is over on the other side of Hoddle Street. On the eastern side of the station is the site of the Victoria Park Railway Goods Yard, part of which is now a community garden. The goods shed platform is still visible, as are some old overhead wiring structures, a relic from when suburban Melbourne had electric goods trains. At the down end of the station is a crossover, allowing trains to reverse direction here if required, although that is an extremely rare occurrence. Two sidings branch off the upline. One is short and unelectrified, used for stapling track maintenance machines, and was only built in the last 12 months to replace a similar siding at Reservoir. The other siding is used to hold two six-car suburban trains during the off-peak period. This siding runs alongside the main line all the way over the Eastern Freeway Bridge. The freeway was built in the 70s and was supposed to carry the proposed railway to Doncaster down the middle, but that was too good to be true. The Doncaster line was going to branch off the Hurstbridge line here, and apparently some early earthworks were carried out but are no longer visible. The freeway bridge does provide an excellent opportunity for rail passengers to point and laugh at the inevitable massive traffic jam which exists here every weekday morning. You also get a good view back towards the city, and if you have eagle eyes you can briefly spot the three Hitachi cars sitting on a Collingwood rooftop. North of the freeway we pass over the line's first level crossing at Ramsden Street and arrive at Clifton Hill, junction for the former Whittlesea line which has had various truncations and re-extensions over the years to now be known as the Mernda Line. Clifton Hill has two platforms, and you can clearly see the space in the middle where a third track existed up until 2009. While down trains normally use Platform 2 and up trains Platform 1, both platforms are fully bi-directional, meaning trains can run through either platform if required, and can also terminate here and reverse direction on any of the three routes. The station was once controlled from a pair of mechanical signal boxes, one at each end of the station, which are now abandoned but still in place. The old manual crossing gates are statically preserved at Ramsden Street, swung back out of the way of modern operations. The junction itself is flat, with down Hurstbridge trains conflicting with up Mernda trains. Now, before we go any further, we need to have a quick chat about single track running. The entire line beyond here was built as single track, with crossing loops at major stations. The line has slowly been duplicated in relatively short sections over the years, including two bits completed while I was making this video, but there are still significant sections of single track. This history of very gradual duplication has very much defined the history of the Hesbridge line, and there are lots of places that show physical evidence of this process. As we roll out of Clifton Hill and through the junction, we pass under Heidelberg Road, which was an early grade separation done back in the 50s. The line then passes over the Mary Creek on a pair of large viaducts. The down line uses the original 1888 viaduct, while the up line runs over a large stick of Swiss cheese installed when the section was duplicated in 2009. The line speed is now 80 kilometers per hour, up from 55 on the first part of the line. 
For the next three and a half kilometres, the line is more or less flat, running along the top of an ancient lava flow, which came down from Mount Fraser, about 35 kilometres away near Beveridge. Sadly, I was unable to photograph this event, as I didn't own a camera until roughly a million years later. The line crosses Westgarth Street on the level, and then arrives into Westgarth Station, which features curved platforms and attractive weatherboard buildings. Westgarth isn't a suburb name, it's located in the suburb of Northcote. When the line first opened, the station was named Westgarth Street for just three months before being named Northcote South for the next 18 years, then getting its current name in 1906. It seems changing station names was a popular hobby in the early 20th century, as you will see with several other places along the line. Westgarth is the best place to connect with tram route 86, despite many official sources telling you to do it at Clifton Hill, and it's a short trip up High Street to lots of good bars and music venues. After rounding the Westgarth curve, we enter by far the longest stretch of straight track on the line, being about two and a quarter kilometres before the next curve. Dennis Station is probably the least remarkable on the line, apart from its slightly funny name, which was apparently the name of a long-serving Northcote councillor. Dennis still falls within the boundaries of Northcote, and doesn't date from the line's opening. It was built much later in 1924. The boring-looking buildings are made up for by an attractive native garden, maintained by a group of locals. Continuing along the strait, we arrive at Fairfield, which was originally optimistically called Fairfield Park, despite being an 800 metre walk from said park, and the name was shortened to its current form in the mid-40s. Fairfield has a large, well-maintained wooden building, mostly now used for non-railway purposes, and a surviving signal box which was last active in the 90s. At the down end of the platforms is the station's straight level crossing, which leads to Fairfield's lively shopping strip, and passengers might also catch a glimpse of this Trojan dog Thing. If you look at a satellite picture of Fairfield, you'll see this very obvious old alignment curving away to the south. It's visible from the train too, but not quite as obvious anymore since they built this ugly great substation in the middle of it. This is the alignment of the Outer Circle Railway, which joined up here when it was opened in 1891. The Outer Circle ran all the way down to Oakley on the Dandenong Line, and would be a great asset if it still survived today. However, the section between Fairfield and Camberwell only operated for a grand total of two years, closing permanently in 1893. The first station on the line was called Fulham Grange and located just here. It would have been visible from passing trains heading to Heidelberg. A short section of the line was reinstated in 1919 as a siding serving the nearby paper mill, and this operated until the early 90s, notably crossing right through the middle of the Heidelberg and Grange Road intersection. Back to the present day, at the side of the former junction, trains now dive down into a concrete trench to pass under Grange Road, which was grade separated by the level crossing removal project in 2018. The line then curves slightly into Elvington Station. There's nothing special about the buildings, but Elvington is set in a lovely spot next to a small strip of shops and surrounded by native vegetation. Right next to the up platform is a significant river red gum, which is listed with the National Trust and estimated to be about 200 years old. This is quite remarkable, as it certainly predates the railway and may even predate British colonisation of the area. Its future was threatened in 2014 when there was a proposal to build a car park on the site, but thankfully those plans were scrapped after significant opposition from the community. On the downside of the station, a short siding once existed serving a small quarry, and this was also the proposed junction for a line to East Preston, which was obviously never built. After Elfington, the line drops down through a shallow cutting, clearly showing the volcanic basalt rock, then jumps over the Darabin Creek on a large viaduct, one of the largest on the network. The Darabin Creek just north of here is a great place to go for a walk or a picnic, and can easily be reached by a short walk from Elfington. If you look underneath the bridge, you can clearly see how it was originally single track with brick pillars, but was widened using concrete when the line was duplicated in 1951. From here, the character of the line changes abruptly, leaving the flat volcanic plain behind and entering hilly sandstone country. Just around the corner is Darabin Station, which opened in 1922, not long after the line was electrified. This station is obviously named after the creek, and isn't a suburb name. We have just entered the suburb of Ivanhoe. Given we're still only 11 kilometres from the city, it might surprise some people that Darabin is one of the least used stations in the electrified area, consistently making it into the bottom 10 for yearly patronage. Its position next to the Darabin parklands means its catchment area isn't huge, and express trains don't stop here, so passengers with a choice probably use Ivanhoe instead. The line climbs gently from Darabin under a couple of nice looking road bridges before levelling out and arriving into Ivanhoe. This is a busy station with substantial brick buildings, and is a short walk from Ivanhoe's busy town centre. This is by far the wealthiest suburb on the whole line, with the median house price currently sitting on about 1.8 million. 
After Ivanhoe, the line dips down slightly before climbing on a 1 in 50 grade up through Eaglemont, which was another later built station appearing in 1926, and like Darabin, is near the bottom of the list for annual passenger numbers. Eaglemont doesn't look like much from the train, but the upside station building is an unusual brick design with several shops built into it down at street level. This is part of the Eaglemont village, which is a lovely little set of shops and cafes with a real community feel. Continuing to the summit of the hill, the line passes through the deepest cutting on the line, which shows off a good cross section of the sandstone. Dropping down from the big cutting, the line passes under two bridges in quick succession. The first is the old Banksia Street Bridge, which now only carries pedestrians, and provides a convenient vantage point for photographers, while the second is the much uglier new Banksia Street Bridge. We then arrive at Heidelberg, which was the original terminus of the line in 1888, and is still one of the most important stations on the line today. The station is a large island platform with an impressive brick building built in 1913, along with a luxurious platform shelter. Trains can terminate here in either direction, but the track layout is quite restrictive, with just a trailing crossover at each end, so trains only have one choice of platform and you can't overtake a train here. The long flat car park on the southeast side of the station is the site of the former railway goods yard, and the goods shed survived tucked in amongst the parking spaces until 2017, when it was annoyingly destroyed by fire. You can still see the iconic Danger Death sign, which warned workers loading goods trains about the danger of overhead wires. I should mention, I'm not going to talk about every former goods yard or siding along the line, as there were quite a lot, but anytime you see a long flat car park like this, fair bet it was once a goods yard. Also in the car park facing the station is this preserved bracket semaphore signal, which was the old upper departure post. The station is dwarfed on the other side by a massive hospital complex, made up predominantly of the Austin Hospital, the Mercy Hospital for Women, and the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute. While I don't encourage getting admitted to hospital if you can avoid it, there are some great views down to the railway from many parts of the buildings. The hospitals are virtually a self-contained suburb operating around the clock and generate a huge amount of traffic. It's always annoyed me that the pedestrian route from the station involves walking down through the underpass, back up to cross the road on the level, then climbing a narrow staircase up to the main entrance, or walking through the underground car park. Accessibility should be a major priority here, and the geometry is perfect for a footbridge to run straight from the hospital entrance level over to the platform, but these sorts of things rarely get done in Melbourne. Leaving Heidelberg, trains pass over Burgundy Street on a burgundy coloured bridge, actually two parallel bridges in two different burgundies, since the line was duplicated here in 2018. Looking to the east, passengers get a great view out over Heidelberg to Doncaster, Mount Dandenong and the Yarra Ranges. I always try to look up from reading at this point because the light and weather make this view different every single day. This section of the line is the first railway seen by many newborn babies, at least it would be if they could focus that far, as it's clearly visible from many parts of the Mercy Maternity Ward. In fact, you can even watch trains while lying in bed in the birthing suite, apparently. Leaving Heidelberg behind, we are now running on the 1902 extension to Eltham. A short distance from Burgundy Street, we encounter the Heidelberg Tunnels, which are a pair of single bore tunnels only about 70 metres long. The original 1902 tunnel on the down line is a traditional brick design, while the 2018 tunnel is a larger diameter concrete build carrying the upline. Given how short these tunnels are, it's kind of surprising they didn't just make it a cutting, but I'm guessing these two residential streets must have already been developed when the line opened. Next up we have Rosanna, which was the last new station built on the line, opening in 1927. The station was completely rebuilt and elevated in 2018 as part of the level crossing removal project, being done at the same time as the duplication from Heidelberg. The old Rosanna station was no great loss, and the new station is certainly a major improvement for passengers. This unassuming looking building at the up end is one of the oldest substations on the network, dating back to the original electrification scheme in the early 1920s. It's still providing power to trains today, although the equipment inside is not original. The former level crossing on Lower Plenty Road used to be quite thrilling for road users coming down the hill, as you would almost get air over the bump when travelling at 60 k's an hour. Speaking of speed, the line speed drops slightly from 80 to 75 at Rosanna, a change which moved here from Heidelberg as part of the duplication project. Continuing north, the line runs parallel to a former golf course, which is now a very nice public park and a great pedestrian route, to the next suburb, McLeod. McLeod has a stabling yard that holds three six-car trains and also has three platforms. Platform three is a dead-end platform often referred to as a back platform. Trains from the city can terminate in either platform two or three, three obviously being the preference as it doesn't block the main line. They can then return to the city or shunt to the yard. Platform one is for up trains only and also has access to the yard. 
During disruptions, up trains sometimes terminate here, reversing either via the yard or by continuing on the upline over Rutherford Street and coming back through this crossover. The preference is to do this via the yard if a siding is free, as it avoids having to activate the level crossing twice. Until recently, a really nice feature of this station was a large number of trees standing on the platform, which probably originally grew along the fence line before the back platform was built. The trees looked nice and provided lots of shade, making McLeod a very pleasant place to wait for a train, but apparently the railways didn't agree and cut them all down in March 2023. A few weeks later, station staff planted some new plants in the empty beds, which is nice, but it's not quite the same. Between 1911 and 1964, McLeod was the junction for one of Melbourne's more obscure branch lines. The Mont Park line was a 1.3 km branch serving the Mont Park Asylum, what we would today call a psychiatric hospital. The line mostly existed to bring in goods, and there was never a regular passenger service. The line climbed on a steep 1 in 30 grade up to the terminus, and was electrified. It's a common misconception that the McLeod back platform is a relic of the Mont Park line, but actually their timelines didn't overlap, and the alignments are slightly different. The whole line is now a long linear park, and there are a few little hints of the railway still visible along the way. By far the most obvious surviving feature is this overhead wiring pole, clearly visible right next to the footpath near the back platform. Back on the main line, leaving McLeod, trains get stuck into a long 1 in 40 grade, the longest significant climb facing down trains on the entire line. About two thirds of the way up the hill is what I believe to be one of the most dangerous pedestrian crossings on the entire system. This crossing is entirely passive, so there are no lights, bells or gates, you just have to stop, look and listen. Now this of course used to be common, and there are still quite a few passive crossings scattered around the network, but it's the position of this one that adds an extra element of danger. The crossing is located in the middle of a big sweeping S-bend made up of two 70 km per hour curves. The orientation of the S-bend means approaching trains are always on the inside curve, and there is really very little warning of approaching trains. There's about 11 seconds between the train first being visible and passing over the crossing. And for me, as an able-bodied adult, it takes about 5 seconds to walk across, so there's very little margin for error. Some trains can be heard a few moments before they come into view, but not all. Being double track obviously adds an extra element of danger here, and it's worth considering that as passive crossings progressively become less common in Melbourne, pedestrians not familiar with the area may not even realise it doesn't provide a warning. A short distance beyond the crossing we reach the summit of the hill, and the highest point on the entire line. Then we drop down into a cutting to arrive at Watsonia. The summit used to be slightly higher, with the railway originally running at ground level along here, but when this section was duplicated in 1979, the line was dropped down into a quite remarkable 1.8 km long cutting, removing three level crossings in the process. This was sticking a railway in a trench long before it was cool. Watsonia Station today is an island platform with a pretty ugly building, and not much in the way of interesting features, although it's worth noting that at least some of these pine trees predate the cutting, and would have been planted near the original ground level station. The line passes under the six lane Greensboro Bypass, soon to become part of the North East Link Freeway, then Grimshaw Street, after which the line resumes its original alignment, descending on a 1 in 40 grade down into the Plenty Valley. The line swings around to head southeast, winding down the hill through four consecutive reverse curves. Just before the bottom is Greensboro Station, which, until just recently, was the end of the double track from the city. In fact, so recently that I'd actually already recorded the voiceover for this section talking about it in the future tense, but then they finished the project faster than I finished the video, and I had to come back and rewrite this part. When the double track arrived here from McLeod in 1979, Greensboro was mostly rebuilt, with a new building and a second platform being added. It was similar in appearance to the Watsonia building, which was part of the same project, and they shared a certain late 70s charm. That project more or less coincided with the opening of Greensboro Plaza, a large shopping centre which really put this suburb on the map. However, it was the 70s, and while the plaza has over 2,500 car parks, pedestrian access from the station clearly wasn't considered at all. It's still far from ideal today, with the most direct route taking in these scenic views. But in 2023, the station was completely rebuilt again, getting a huge new concourse and a wider, straight island platform. Both platforms are fully bi-directional, with double crossovers at both ends, so trains can terminate here from either direction in either platform. This functionality is also used frequently during peak times, when many trains terminate at Greensboro, which means both up and down trains can run through while a terminating train is occupying one of the platforms, although they obviously have to take turns. 
In early proposals for the station rebuild, a third platform was going to be included, which would have really streamlined this, removing any conflict between the three trains, but unfortunately that didn't go ahead. Prior to the recent works, Greensboro was home to another 1920s substation, very similar to the one at Rosanna, but it was demolished as part of the project. Just beyond the platforms, the line winds through some tight 40k curves, then down to the Plenty River. The bridge over the Plenty River was until recently a very attractive spot surrounded by mature trees, however most of them were annihilated as part of the duplication works. The old single track bridge, which is now the downline, is quite an interesting structure. The main span over the river is a steel girder with a timber deck, supported on these unusually shaped brick pillars. The approach spans are concrete, but would have originally been timber trestles. The new bridge which carries the upline is a huge steel girder, which they have at least painted a nice colour. Interestingly, this new bridge has a cantilever section. The girder was delivered in two halves and bolted together in the middle, but the single concrete support isn't underneath the join. Back when the old bridge got its concrete abutments, they actually left provision for a second bridge to be installed, but failed to anticipate how much standards would change over time, and the new girder was far too large to fit on it. Having crossed the river, the line gets stuck into another 1 in 40 grade, climbing up the other side of the valley, all the way to the next station, Montmorency. This station opened in 1923, the same year this section was electrified. It's located at the end of Weir Street, a nice strip of shops and cafes which has managed to retain some character despite the surrounding suburbia. This is where the recent duplication ends, and the large new double track station replaced a single curved platform, which was quite an attractive spot despite the underwhelming building. It wasn't easy fitting a new station here, as modern requirements demand straight platforms, and the old platform was on both a vertical and horizontal curve. To make a straight section of track long enough, the alignment had to be altered quite significantly. Here we are on board a down train in late 2022, and you can see the new up platform being constructed here. Now arriving at Montmorency. As we arrive into the existing single platform. The new track layout and signalling allows up trains to terminate here in the case of disruptions, something that wasn't previously possible. Down trains can also terminate here, but need to shunt to the single track section before proceeding back onto the upline. The double track was actually supposed to continue around 900 metres beyond this point, about halfway to Eltham. But then, something a bit unexpected happened. Immediately on the downside of the old station, the crest of the grade is located in this attractive cutting, running through a patch of remnant native vegetation. Just as construction was set to begin, a citizen scientist found a population of a local celebrity, the very rare Eltham copper butterfly, which the official project survey had conveniently missed. The Eltham copper is listed as endangered, and is a Lazarus species, meaning it was thought to be extinct for a time before being rediscovered. It now only exists in a handful of small isolated populations and is seriously threatened by habitat loss, so there was really no way forward either ethically or legally, and the duplication had to be cut back to end just before the cutting. While this situation is hardly ideal, the proposed new timetable is still possible, just with less flexibility in the case of late running. One last thing here, opposite the old platform was a lone surviving telegraph pole, which obviously escaped removal whenever the telegraph line was discontinued. Amazingly, it survived being in the middle of a construction site all year, and at the time of writing is still standing, visible from the new station. From Monty, the single track drops down into the Diamond Valley, once again on a 1 in 40 gradient with a series of gentle curves. You probably noticed I've mentioned 1 in 40 grades a few times now. If we have a look at the gradient diagram, you can see the line has climbed mostly at that grade from McLeod up to Watsonia. This diagram is from 1927, so it's the original ground level Watsonia, but at this scale it would still be pretty close. Then down into the Plenty Valley and across the river, up the other side to Montmorency, and then down into the Diamond Valley to Altham, from where the line follows the gentle grade of the Diamond Creek all the way to Hurstbridge. The Victorian railways did build some lines with grades as steep as 1 in 30, but on this line they were careful to maintain a maximum of 1 in 40. The first view of Altham is from the worst possible angle, coming around the back of the industrial estate, but that changes moments later as the line runs through parkland and across the Diamond Creek on the Altham Trestle Bridge. This is the only timber bridge remaining anywhere on the Victorian railway network, and is an iconic local landmark. I could talk for a very long time about this bridge, but I've already done that in a dedicated video, so if you'd like to learn more about it, please head over and watch that one. Shortly after the trestle, the line arrives at Eltham Station, which was the line's terminus from 1902 to 1912. Eltham is the last really busy station on the line, and around half of trains terminate here. The station consists of two bi-directional platforms forming an island, so up and down trains can cross here. The usual pattern is that terminating trains and up trains use platform 2, while down trains bound for Hurstbridge use 1. 
but other patterns do happen at certain times of day. Next to the station is the site of the former goods yard, which is now a stabling yard with capacity for five trains. An unusual feature of the track layout here is siding A, which branches off on the downside of the Diamond Street level crossing. It's not actually for stabling trains, but is used by trains shunting between the platforms and the yard. It was built in 2013 when the layout of the yard was changed, removing access from the up end. When a train moves from the platforms to the yard or vice versa, it has to stop for several minutes while the driver changes ends, and siding A allows that to be done without blocking the main line. One example of how this gets used is a terminating train will arrive from the city, disgorge its passengers as an up train is arriving, then shunt into siding A, allowing a down train to run through immediately behind, clearing the line for the up to depart, then leaving plenty of time for the first train to shunt across to the yard. One disadvantage of this practice is having to cross Diamond Street multiple times, and when moving between sidings that's done at no more than 15 km per hour, so the level crossing spends quite a lot of time activated during these moves. Next to the station facing the bus interchange is a preserved semaphore signal, and I can hardly talk about Eltham today without quickly mentioning its recent signalling history. Eltham was operated by mechanical interlocking with semaphore signals and token safe working right up until 2013, and the preserved post is the former down direction signal off platform 2. The line from Greensboro to Eltham was protected by miniature electric staff, and towards Hurstbridge was train staff and ticket. I won't go into detail about how those systems work here, but the super short explainer is that there's a metal rod called a staff with the names of the stations engraved into it, and it's only possible for one driver to be in possession of the staff at any given time, preventing multiple trains entering the single track. The staff was usually attached to a hoop, allowing drivers and signalers to exchange staffs without stopping, and many people remember seeing scenes like this. Despite being 19th century technology, it was really cool living on a line still using these practices right into the early 2010s. The lever frame is still in place, and you can view it through the window along with a bunch of other historical items. Anyway, back to the present and modern electronic signalling. Departing Eltham, we are now on the final extension of the line which opened in 1912, and the line speed has dropped slightly again, down to 65 km per hour. The line now enters a much more rural setting, although there is still plenty of suburbia nearby. Perched on top of a cutting just out of Eltham is this thing, which is the base of the former up distance semaphore signal. The line then runs alongside Railway Parade, which is, I believe, one of only two places in Melbourne where electric trains run parallel to a public dirt road. 10 points if you can tell me where the other one is. Heading alongside the suburb of Eltham North, the line passes Edendale Farm, which is a small council run farm with lots of animals educating the community about environmental sustainability. Crucially, you can also get coffee there. The line then dives into the first real patch of bushland, and trains are invariably being watched by a large number of children over the creek at the Eltham North Adventure Playground. The line rounds a tight 40k curve through a scenic cutting, then runs on a long straight, exhibiting some of Melbourne's finest quality track. past a nice wetland and under some high voltage power lines. In the early 20th century the valley was home to many fruit orchards which generated a lot of the outward goods loading for the railway. You can still see some subtle remains of this industry, including a few trees which might be part of that history. Halfway along this strait is an interesting relic of the line's early years. This is milepost 18, the last remaining imperial measurement post on the line. It's positioned a short distance on the downside of the modern day 30 km post, and while writing this I suddenly realised that doesn't work out mathematically. Relative to the modern measurements, the 18 mile point should be roughly 1100 metres back towards Eltham. A bit of research led me to the fact that lines leaving the city from the east were originally measured from Flinders Street, but when the VR went metric they re-measured them from Spencer Street, which was the zero point for the rest of the network. Having somehow escaped removal during metrication, it narrowly cheated death again in 2013 when a new signal was erected right next to it. Long live milepost 18! A bit further along is Allendale Road, which still feels a bit like a country level crossing and is right next to a single lane road bridge over the creek. The line passes a large flat grassy area, which sometimes has a lake during winter, and is a great spot for recreational activities like watching trains, photographing trains, or just sitting and thinking about trains. Re-entering bushland, the line then crosses the Diamond Creek four times in the space of 600 metres, Originally this was done by means of four wooden bridges, but they were all destroyed by a bushfire in 1969. The middle two were replaced with simple open deck steel bridges, 
which are quite unusual in Victoria, and the outer two were boringly replaced by Armco culverts. In the middle of this area is an enormous empire of dirt BMX jumps, which has been slowly growing over many years. If you know where to look, there are also remains of old gold mines around here, and another sneaky surviving telegraph pole. Around the next curve, the line passes another large playground, and importantly another place to get coffee, at a cafe featuring an SW5 class tram. I should mention that the line is closely followed by a cycling and walking track called the Diamond Creek Trail, all the way from Eltham to Hurstbridge. It's a great community asset and a transport link in its own right, and many of the views in this video wouldn't be possible without it. Diamond Creek Station is 5.2 kilometres from Eltham, one of the longer gaps on the network. If we look at the map for a moment, you can see the line has taken a very indirect route since Watsonia. In fact, it's only 5.5 kilometres in a straight line between Diamond Creek and Greensboro, but nearly 10 kilometres by rail. The reasoning for this is pretty simple. Eltham was by far the most important locality at the time the line was built, and there just wasn't much happening in that area in between. Diamond Creek is where the second part of the recent duplication project begins. Prior to 2023, this was just a short crossing loop, but it has now been extended a little over 2 kilometres almost to Waddle Glen. Platform 2 used to only be used in peak times when trains were crossing, and was quite narrow with minimal facilities. But with the new arrangement, it now carries all up trains and was widened as part of the project. While down trains can now only use Platform 1 and up trains Platform 2, down trains are able to terminate in either platform if required. This station is also a very rare example of non-standard platform numbering. Conventionally, Platform 1 is always on the left when facing the city, but it's the other way around here. That's because Platform 2 was only built in the mid-90s, and they obviously decided to make the far more commonly used platform the important-sounding number 1. Beyond Diamond Creek, the line continues up the valley, through another power line reservation, and on to the second last station on the line, Wattle Glen, where the new duplication ends shortly before the platform. This is the least used station on the electrified network. Jeff Marshall would love it here. There's only one shop nearby, and the surrounding housing is quite sparse. It opened as Bay Lee, becoming Wattle Glen in 1922. The station consists of a single platform and feels a bit like a quaint rural station, although it was a lot quainter in the early 2000s when it still had a dirt car park and hardly anything else. Wattle Glen provides a good access point to the bike track midway between Diamond Creek and Hurstbridge if you just want to go for a short walk or ride. The last part of the line to Hurstbridge is very scenic, slowly winding between tall gum trees and passing through several cuttings. A unique feature of this section is the presence of several passive road level crossings, something found nowhere else on the suburban network. Only one of these is a named public road, Mary Place. The others are private driveways, leading to houses on the west side of the line. Some of these crossings did also exist back towards Diamond Creek, but those ones were upgraded to have boom gates as part of the duplication. However, the ones beyond Wattle Glen are remaining. One very notable crossing is positioned in the middle of this scenic S-bend near Hurstbridge, known to some people as Shut the Bloody Gate Curve, after a memorable sign that used to stand at the entrance to the property. This crossing was recently fitted with flashing lights and bells, but no boom gates, being the only crossing with that arrangement in the suburban area. If you haven't seen a kangaroo yet, you may well see one grazing near the oval as your train rounds the last couple of curves into the terminus. Hurstbridge is a single platform with stabling space for five trains, two next to the platform and three at the down end. Unusually, there's a public pedestrian crossing between the platform and the sidings. Hurstbridge is really where the suburbs end, and in many ways feels a lot like a country town. Just near the station is the former station master's residence, and over near the down end yard is a brick substation dating from the final stage of the line's electrification in 1926, although this one is no longer in use. Once a year in August or September, the area around the station is transformed for the Hurstbridge Waddle Festival, named for the bright yellow wattle flowers which fill the valley during winter. The festival was inspired by a Wattle Day event held in 1912, not long after the rally opened, and the modern incarnation has run since 2004, skipping a couple of years during COVID. Steamrail Victoria operates special shuttles during the event, providing a regular opportunity to experience steam travel on the Hurstbridge Line. So that's it, we made it! This turned out to be a much longer video than I was expecting, so to anyone who's made it this far, thank you very much for watching. And for those of you who commute on the Hurstbridge line, I hope you've learned a thing or two to add some interest to your daily trip.